Well, here's the NASA meatball, which uh, now is a permanent fixture of all uh, spaceflight movies now. And a good picture of uh, our flag uh, there and uh, Space Shuttle Columbia's flag uh, pre-launch. As you see, a few clouds in the area, but uh, we managed to hold them off until, uh, until long enough for us to get off the, get off the ground. Standard picture of us uh, going out to the vehicle. It was kind of odd to uh, be up that time of the day. It was pretty easy for us, but uh, Carl Mead, uh, Gene Trin, and Ellen Baker had had the sleep shift almost 12 hours, and they had just, at about that point, uh, they were about ready to go to bed, even though we were just getting up. Ken, you want to describe the launch? Well, uh, the launch was quite a ride for me. I, uh, when the engines lit, uh, I didn't get too excited, but I did look over to the left to see what the gantry looked like. And I noticed that it started glowing before we started moving as we got the reflections of the engines and the SRBs. Then uh, it slowly moved out of the, out of the way. The, uh, the liftoff sensation felt just like we get in a simulator. I was very pleased with the uh, training that we'd had and felt very comfortable during the launch. I know the biggest impression I get on any launch is uh, the bright lights. Um, you can see a little bit of that here during the roll program maneuver. And unfortunately for our guests down at the Cape, we, we disappeared into the clouds pretty soon after liftoff, so they didn't get to see, uh, see us all the way out to Miko. But I can assure you the ride was very comfortable and very smooth, and uh, the engines and SRBs worked just as advertised. Once we got up on orbit, we uh, caught our breath and then started right to work activating the space lab. Um, I was a little bit captivated by the scenery, uh, but Bonnie was an old veteran and went right to work. Well, the activation started out on the flight deck about two hours after launch by activating the Space Lab systems through the orbiter's computers. And then about three and a half hours after launch, uh, we went down the tunnel and I opened the hatch to the lab, uh, ingress down through the tunnel and up over what we call the lip into the lab. We started uh, operations immediately that day, and what you're seeing here is actually uh, into the flight, and, and then uh, here's some blue ship uh, shots with Gene and Carl. This is uh, myself on the foreground working on the surface tension driven experiment, and Carl moving by holding a drop physics module film magazine, which he became so good at changing the film. <laughs> this is a close up of the uh, drop physics module with the bay one door open. You can see some of the instrumentation inside. And this is a live shot, uh, almost live shot, of a drop deployment. And this is a very successful deployment. And thank you, Carl, for taking a picture of that. <laughs> the drop physics module was controlled through the IVA that you see. There's a second CRT on the right. And this is a short uh, sequence of uh, the behavior of the drop in microgravity. Uh, these drops, once they were deployed, almost uh, took a life of by themselves uh, be because of its beha their behavior in the absence of gravity and also because of uh, what we did to them with acoustic radiation pressure. The aim here was to determine in a very quantitative fashion the behavior of those drops in microgravity. And this is another close-up view of the surface tension driven convection experiment with the uh, sequence of what you could see looking at one of the video downlink looking at flow visualization pattern. These are speckle patterns of the tracer particles in the flow. And this is uh, myself working in the glove box once again. And I was doing protein crystal growth experiments. And here you see a close up of the way I did that. I used uh, common syringes, Hamilton syringes that you use in your laboratory. I basically did what I do in my own laboratory, which is what I've said for a long time we really need in space is to have our own lab up there. And for the first time on USML, we had the equipment to do that and the time. And I was using a microscope to observe crystals that I grew on orbit. And from that information, looking at the crystals, I then decided how to change the conditions to optimize the crystal growth. And uh, that's also the first time we've ever been able to do this uh, in flight. And here's a crystal of the first protein that I crystallize in orbit. It's cannabalin, and it's a pro uh, plant protein uh, that was donated to us by a professor at the University of uh, California, Riverside. And cannabalin's being looked at to genetically engineer a more nutritious uh, food. And this is the generic bioprocessing apparatus. And once again, these are the samples being loaded into a device which will measure the turbidity 
of each sample so that we can get essentially a time history of their, their development um, throughout the microgravity experience. I think it's worth pointing out that uh, for 13 days and 26 shifts, we had almost flawless performance of all of our hardware. And in fact, we were able to process more than we expected. Uh, I'm working in here in a what's called a flexible glove box facility for the crystal growth furnace, which allowed us to change out uh, potentially toxic, toxic materials. And uh, we had a chance to evaluate this because we wanted to process more materials. And I think it's a good demonstration for space station. Uh, we had spare samples, which allowed us to do this and actually produce more than we expected. Uh, this is another uh, shot of the glove box. And I believe an experiment in here, which is uh, called, um, oh, this is smoldering combustion. I, 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 combustion I, 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 for a little bit. They take a, a piece of foam and see how it smolders in microgravity, again, without the um, benefits of buoyancy or the effects of buoyancy, I should say. And it's a, a, another combustion type of experiment in that module, which is in there. And it's closed up so that the particles can burn and not affect the crew in any way. As you can see, there's a video camera hooked to the top uh, for data collection. Again, uh, referring back to the earlier slide, uh, Larry and I spent several days of our, our mission working uh, and performing experiments with the lower body negative pressure device. We also were able to visualize the heart during this process with a, a nearly off-the-shelf uh, medical instrument called the echocardiograph. And it was a Doppler e echocardiograph and that it would use sound waves to also measure the velocity of blood flow going through the heart. And we got quite a bit of, quite a, a quantity of data from that uh, particular experiment. We're going to go back down to the tunnel now into the mid deck and give you uh, a feel for going through a little bit of what of our obstacle course was and see what uh, mid deck operations were. If you recall, the lab is uh, aft in the payload bay and there's a very long tunnel that connects it uh, to the mid deck. We use this area as a little bit of a storage area, and I'll turn it over to uh, Ken to talk about that. Well, this had to be one of my favorite things to do up in orbit, uh, cruising back and forth through the tunnel. Um, it was sort of like being Superman, uh, flying over long distances. It was a little bit of an obstacle course, too, but uh, luckily everything was soft, so it didn't hurt too bad if you bumped into things. Um, here we're entering the mid-deck, and you can see how we've got things hanging on the lockers with Velcro. and. Uh, you can also see how easy it is to float on up through the hatch into the flight deck. And you just saw Dick's leg where he was on duty there. This was, uh, well, I can't remember where this was, but over Australia or maybe over the U.S. Again, I mentioned we were able to beam people up and beam people down uh, uh, if they had the right uh, ham radio equipment and uh, just talked to this individual. And uh, you can see the picture come on the screen uh, through, uh, through the ham radio operation. This, again, turned out to be a lot of fun for us to do. and. Uh, I think Helen and I tabbed up that we were talking to about 100 people a day for the uh, period that we were up in space and I think generated a lot of goodwill for the space program throughout the world. One of our many sunrises and sunsets, uh, it would be totally inappropriate not to uh, capture one of these, attempt to capture one of these uh, spectacular sunrises and sunsets and include it in uh, our photography. And uh, again, uh, we did have time to look out the window uh, during our 13 days, and you can see it always brings smiles to people's faces when we had time to do that. Ellen can describe you this little tour as well, too. Um, again, it's uh, one of those things that's hard to capture and hard to describe. Uh, another nice clear pass over uh, the, uh, the Canary Islands and onto the coast of Africa. Um, we did quite a bit of training uh, with our Earth Ops people here, and uh, I tried to brush up on my geography with things going by at five miles a second. If you don't know what you're looking at, you don't have time to go look it up in the book. Uh, we have a little display on one of our onboard computers that gives you a general ballpark for where you are in the world. Uh, sometimes a scene like this going over the Middle East is uh, readily recognizable the Sinai Peninsula there and everything, but there are parts of the world that I'm not that familiar with, and, uh, and so I tried to bone up on my geography some. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to see a lot of South America. This is a, a pass coming over the uh, coast of South America and the Andes, and it was uh, remarkably clear over South America as well, but uh, for most of our daylight South America passes, I was this passes, I was this, and Dick and Sox were awake taking these pictures. We were 
very fortunate with uh, our South American visit. It was about the driest I've ever seen in that particular area. So a lot of our a lot of our observations were possible, whereas before you would be cloud covered. This is uh, Ellen uh, dis proudly displaying her New York Yankee hat while she uh, goes through the process of getting some exercise. And you can, s and then uh, Carl, who had some stretching exercise, he was one of our backup EVA crewmen, and. Uh, I cautioned him to make sure he kept his muscles in good shape in case we had to go outside unexpectedly. And so this was his way of uh, doing some stretching exercises during the flight. Again, uh, food, uh, we got a chance to uh, do uh, food operations, as I would call them. And uh, everybody uh, would try to come up with some new uh, stunts to outdo the next person uh, with uh, rotating spoons or uh, floating uh, meatballs or whatever Ken is trying to grapple yes. with. And potatoes. <laughs> Grooming was always very important, and uh, I found myself using, for the first time, an electric razor. <laughs> and uh, one of the first things to go on orbit is your hair. And uh, so, but we've come a long way and got some, uh, got some uh, shampoo equipment that uh, we just scrub on and then wipe off with a towel. Of course, you've got to sort of keep yourself in control here, and I'm not doing a very good job of it <laughs> right now. And uh, we've got a personal hygiene kit, little mirror, and uh, brush your hair, and uh, you're, you're ready to go for the day. Uh, this personal hygiene kit contains a lot of uh, toilet articles, uh, and so it was always a question, difficulty trying to manage it here about where to put all these things, even though they had Velcro. It seemed like every time I opened it up, there was about three or four things I wanted to take out. This was an unsuccessful attempt to manage that. <laughs> And the sleeping quarters were very, very adequate, and I found myself sleeping quite a bit. And of course, uh, when you wake up in the morning, you have to find your way out. Sometimes they didn't want me to get out of there and put the ergometer right in front of it, but that didn't deter me. <laughs> this was our first, my first flight with these sleep stations, and it was a nice, quiet place to go to give you a little privacy for two weeks, and I uh, can't imagine flying without it. Well, one of the pilots' job on orbit is, is cleaning. My wife liked that. She liked seeing me operate the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> um, here I'm trying to clean some of the filters. It's uh, important to keep the equipment cool, and keeping the filters clean uh, contributes to that. I believe this is Dick and I uh, preparing for FCS checkout, getting all the systems ready for deorbit. Helen was right in there helping out, and uh, it was a three-person three operation. Everything was, uh, everything was nominal on the day before entry, so Ken and I went to bed. We got waved off uh, one day due to, uh, of all things, a July hurricane in California. Uh, so that was the only bit of misfortune we had, but the good side of it was that the Kennedy Space Center, I guess all the bad weather got sucked into California because Florida was beautiful. Next day, uh, after one day, one day appreciated, one day delay, which all of, us gave, all of us got an opportunity to look out the window on that day, we started re-entry. This is some camcorder footage. I, I wish I could describe to you what I'm seeing out my window here, but it's, you can see that burnt orange down uh, the filling up the window, and then you see a very bright white light there just to the right. That's actually a blue, thin blue band caused by sunrise, and there was a big orange glow on top of that. There was, uh, I wish I could have had time to get the camcorder with a big wide angle lens over. We, uh, as I say, it was a beautiful day in Florida. It was pilot's kind of day. Uh, acquired the runway uh, way out. Uh, we had a new capability here with a, we added some extra speed to the orbiter to get us further down the runway. Uh, this is the first flight of that, also the first flight of the, some new tires uh, that, uh, that uh, are more resistant to uh, damage on rough runways, particularly like the one we have at the Kennedy Space Center. Touchdown seemed to me to be very smooth, and uh, at no time did I feel like I was uh, really behind the uh, vehicle. We, had, we intentionally uh, delayed derotation of the nose gear by about 10 knots due, due to our weight. Got that down on the uh, runway, and immediately Ken uh, deployed the uh, drag chute. Throughout the uh, rollout sequence, the winds were very light, and uh, I felt uh, very, uh, very similar to the way I felt in my uh, previous four-day flight of uh, uh, a very solid vehicle, very tightly controlled, and uh, absolutely no problems. At 60 knots, uh, in order to keep the drag chute from being entangled in the drag chute, we intentionally jettisoned. Uh, the chute, and then uh, finally a roll to a stop uh, with uh, using up about 13,000 feet of the 15,000 feet of uh, runway we had there. 
this isn't cooling fans for us. This is to blow the ga any gases that might be out, the harmful gases, away from the uh, vehicle. But uh, very quickly, Ken and I were able to get out and do an inspection of the vehicle, and everything looked great to us. All in all, two weeks in space, well spent. I couldn't ask for anything more out of my vehicle or, or my crew.